Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with Symphonies by the Numbers. And now we're up to number four. 16 Great Symphonies, number four. And these are really good number fours, I have to say. Because, you know, by the time most symphonists get up to number four, they're either ready to quit or they are really in the middle of their maturity and doing fantastic work. So these are really wonderful, wonderful pieces. One of them which is missing, which I've seen you guys mention in a bunch of context, is Alfin, the Swedish composer, Hugo Alfin. I have to be honest and say, I just don't think he's a symphonist. And the fourth is probably his greatest one, all things considered, and it still drives me crazy. Yes, it has wordless vocalises in it, and it's very Straussian and lush, but I, it just goes on way too long, and I, I can't be bothered with him. I like a lot of his other music, don't get me wrong. And they're attractive pieces, but should they be on the list of really great fourth symphonies or other second symphonies? Nah. Just because, you, they, just because something exists, that doesn't mean it's up to the level of my list. Now, what's on your list, of course, is up to you. But I have certain standards that I rigorously uphold. And so everything on my list rises to that level. And I dare you to come up with something better. Well, I mean, yeah. let's face it. A lot of these are obvious choices, right? So let's get right to it and see what 16 gems we're going to be talking about today. Number one, well, Beethoven's fourth, because the Eroica got on the third. Beethoven didn't get on the list until Symphonies number three. But now with number four, he's there. And as I've said, like a lot of times, mostly to uh, an, an empty auditorium, I think the fourth is a better work than the Eroica, not more important. No, no, not more important historically, but I just think as a piece of musical craftsmanship and, and expressive point and particularly orchestral mastery, holy cow, it's a light year ahead of the Eroica. I adore the fourth, so it would have to be the first thing on my list. Next, let's see, oh, Mendelssohn's number four, the Italian symphony. I mean, you know, Mendelssohn, I keep trying to make the case for him. Mendelssohn seems to be a little bit on the outs. In some ways he is and in some ways he isn't. He is in the sense that that we are so hung up now on late romantic grandiosity, on the Bruckners and Mahlers and the fin de siècle people, that we, we have sort of given up on the earlier romantics, which is a terrible shame because great music is great music, number one, and number two, because these people had a lot to offer expressively just in their own way, as, as most composers will. And the Italian symphony is delicious. You know, one of the things about it is that, you know, Mendelssohn never published it in his lifetime. He kept saying he wanted to revise it. And I actually think I kind of know what he wanted to revise, because I think the two inner movements lack a certain amount of contrast. I could be totally wrong, but it seems to me that if he wanted to work on something, he would have done something with those movements. He might even have replaced one. They're lovely as they are, of course, you know, in and of themselves. But it just seems to me that he would have wanted to have something with a little bit more, more uh, rhythmic oomph in a scherzo, or maybe even a more solemn adagio, something to give the piece a little bit, a little bit more, more meat on its bones, because it is a lightweight work. But it's such a wonderfully lightweight work. I mean, you know, the first movement is just magical, and so is the finale. So Mendelssohn Fourth has to be on the list, and it's fun to speculate on what was wrong with it because he was so self-critical. But I, I can't pretend, in my you know, boundless arrogance, to think that I really know better than he did. I really don't. So it's just it's just fun to speculate. Next, Schumann Symphony Number no. Four. I left out the Rhenish and I left out the second. And the reason is because Schumann symphonies are all sort of Schumann-esque. And I think it's enough to have just a couple of them in these lists. You know, you all know what the rest of them are. But the fourth, I think, is, is quite a remarkable piece. I really do, because, because it has a, a powerfully interesting cyclical construction, which was, by the way, strongly influenced, in my view, by Mendelssohn's Scottish Symphony, um, which came a little bit earlier. And I also think that 
it, it has it has wonderful thematic material and it just a very very cool overall form with all the movements played attacka it, it's great stuff i mean do you know I mean, it was just just an example in the fourth symphony you know it, it, the first movement ar arrives at um, a motto theme for the whole symphony, right? It's yum, bum, 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 ba dum, bum, bum. That, that's the thing. Dum, bum, 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 ba dum, bum, bum. That's, that's the, the motto theme. And the scherzo begins with that theme. Bum, 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 ba dum. It's, it's the same tune, but it's so marvelously transformed. And the thing that makes it even more fascinating is that that marvelously transform, transformed mot motivic idea was actually filched from the scherzo of Kalavoda's first symphony. But Schumann makes it work in his cyclical... Oh, it's just really fun. It's really fun. So Schumann's fourth has to be on the list. Next, let's see who's there. Oh, of course, Tchaikovsky's fourth. Tchaikovsky is now making the list. Not that one, two, and three aren't lovely. I think number two is adorable. And I think one is already something of a masterpiece. I really do. It, the finale lets it down a little bit, maybe. But it's a beautiful work. Winter, winter Dreams. Oh, it's gorgeous. Absolutely. And totally Tchaikovsky. And so, you know, again, don't let the fact that something's not on a list, you know, bum you out. Most of it very easily could, unless it's by Alfin, in which case we can't bother with it. But basically, yes, there are many, many other options. And the Tchaikovsky Fourth is one of them. It has a lot of really bad performances, though, doesn't it? Oh, my goodness. I mean, some of these people play it so poorly. It's a tough piece to do. It really is. I've done a talk on it, so you can go and see what the best ones are. And then after Tchaikovsky Fourth, we have to have Brahms Fourth. I left off, you may recall, because i got an itch here, excuse me, I left off Brahms II and caused, oh my goodness, World War IV almost erupted over the fact that I left off Brahms II. But Brahms IV I happily include. It is beautiful, lovely, I don't need to tell you, everyone loves it. It's actually a very, a very tough piece of music in a way, expressively particularly, you know, with its turbulent Pasakalia ending and whatnot. It's, it's a wonderful work. Just wonderful. I don't need to tell you that. It's on the list. Next, Maniard, Alberic Maniard, Symphony Number no. Four. Gosh, this is a great symphony. It's really the great French symphony after the Franck, and well, in Saint Saëns Third, and then there's like the Maniard Third and Fourth, and then Roussel. And if you have those people, <laughs> then you've basically got the French Romantic Symphony in a nutshell. You really do. But this fourth is gorgeous. It has the most evocative motto theme. Da da da, ya da da da, da da. Well, that was bad, wasn't it? But you know, it's ya da 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 da. Okay, that was a little better, but it's a great piece. An absolutely phenomenal piece of music that you've got to hear if you don't know it. So Maniard Fourth is phenomenal, and like I always do in these talks, the list is below in the in the, the description of this video, so you can see what all the titles are and ignore my pronunciation. And after Maniard, we have Nielsen's Fourth, the Inextinguishable, which is in in, in Danish Det Unods Klub. Yes, in Danish. This is the one that has two sets of timpani pounding the daylights out of each other in the, in, the, in the finale. Gosh, it's exciting. It's another piece. Actually, it's influenced in a sense by Schumann's fourth because it is also in one unified movement. I mean, it's in four movements, but they're played without pause. And my God, it's a thrill. I mean, it's so bloody exciting. If you ever get a chance to go see it live, just go see it. You're not going to believe it's going to be over before you know it. It's a thrilling piece of music full of struggle and turbulence and, and amazing changes of mood and huge ranges and tempo and dynamics. And oh, it's just cosmically fabulous. It really is. It should be far more popular than it is because it's just such a thrill. And you know, it's one of those pieces, I think it works better live than on disc because when people go and hear it, it was the same thing with the Fifth Symphony, by the way, when I saw Vanska do it with the New York Phil. Everybody just turns around afterwards and says, where has this been? It's amazing. You know, but then 
but, but people don't talk about it afterwards for some reason. I don't know. It's, it's great music, just great music. So Nielsen's fourth, and we're almost halfway there, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, seven. This is number eight. Finally, you'll all be so happy. Bruckner for the romantic, the, the normal version. The one with the hunting scherzo, the one with the big finale, not the Gutman 1888 version, the one from, you know, 1878, 81, 82, somewhere in there, whenever it was. That's the one. It is, of course, the first great Bruckner symphony. And the reason the fourth gets on the list is essentially is because in doing his endless revisions, Bruckner changed it from a first movement symphony, which is what the original version is, to a finale symphony which is what the definitive version is. And so it becomes more one of the late works than one of the early works. So I understand people who prefer to hear, hear the earlier version. It's, it's different enough, in a sense, in its, in its weight and balance and feeling for form that I could understand it. But I think the much more powerful musical experience is the revised version. And it's just, you know, the romantic. It's lovely. It's wonderful. Uh, then we have, oh yes, Vaughan Williams, Symphony Number no. 4, Godzilla Eats Tokyo. <laughs> Godzilla attacks Bristol, but Godzilla's eating something in this symphony. It's a big, mean, gnarly, nasty, fun piece of music. Oh, it's so much fun. And, you know, the last two movements, it's a scherzo run on to the finale, which is cribbed from Beethoven's fifth, but the transition is quite different. Instead of ba ba ba, it goes da da da. <laughs> and it's like Beethoven's fifth upside down. And then you have that fabulous, fabulous ending. It's a fugato with all the themes from the family. They all get tangled up in this contrapuntal maelstrom. And finally, the opening bars come back, you know, Da 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 da, oh, do, do, do. Bum, bum, bum. crash, da 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 da, boom, and that's the end. And that boom, by the way, is the only note on the bass drum in the entire symphony. Von Williams saves it for the very last chord. Oh, it's so much fun! Great, great work. So then, oh, Mahler four. You remember that one? Sleigh bells, ching, 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 do 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 Oh, it's just wonderful. I don't need to tell you that Mahler's Fourth is a masterpiece. It's his lightest, shortest, and for that reason, most popular symphony, or it was when nobody did Mahler. You know, the one everyone took out was the fourth because they figured it was the one people could tolerate. Um, nowadays, we do the second symphony at the drop of a hat, even the eighth, so it hardly makes any difference. Um, you know, which one you're talking about anymore. But back in the day, it was always the fourth. And it's his most Schubertian, classical, neoclassical even work. It has no trombones, but the orchestration is just mwah, amazing. Glorious piece of music. So that has to be on any short list of great fourth symphonies. Next, well, here's one you may not know too well. Yunus Kokkonen, the Finnish composer, who's perhaps best known to the extent he's known at all, for his wonderful opera, The Last Temptations, a glorious opera, fabulous stage work about, about the trials and tribulations of a, a Lutheran preacher in rural Finland. I mean, you might not think it's exciting, but it actually is. It's really, it's really, it's, it's very, very moving and very interesting. But Kokonen wrote four symphonies. And they start out being rather dodecaphonic or 12-tone, and then they become freer and more tonal. But he was an incredibly concise composer. His symphonies are like, you know, two, three, three or four movements, 20 minutes, 25 minutes max. He also wrote a glorious cello concerto. There's some really good music that he wrote. He was a good composer. But his output was not large. And the fourth symphony is, I think, fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. It has three movements that go sort of slow, fast, slow. The scherzo is wonderful. It's a wonderful application of the Sibelius sort of fragmentation and build-up technique where 
where where bits of theme flit through the texture and then they only come to one huge climax when the when the big tune finally pops up sort of like the finale of the third symphony the tune is bum ba da 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 i mean that's all it is and it just goes in and out of this wonderful texture then finally it just erupts in the in the in the brass it's glorious it's absolutely glorious. The first movement also does the same thing. It it forms a tune. In this case, it's a march. It's yum ba da 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 ba da 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 da. It's 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 hummable music. It's good music. And then there's an adagio finale. It's it's just a wonderful piece. One of the things that um, that first tune in the first movement reminds me of is the the march at the end of the Frank Martin. Petite Symphony Concertante. It's almost identical. And also there's a tune in it very similar from Hindemith Symphony in D-flat. I wonder if Kokonen was aware of any of that. I have no idea. But do listen to his fourth symphony. I think you'll find it a very a very moving and 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 it's just it gets under your skin. It really does. It's a, it's a great piece. So, Kokonen's fourth after Kokonen. Piston Symphony number no. 4. Yeah, I continue to insist that Piston was a terrific symphonist. His second symphony is marvelous. The sixth is fabulous. I'm sure we'll be encountering that later on in this series. And the fourth is its as great as the sixth. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. I, why people don't listen to this stuff, I have no idea. But it, it is a wonderful scherzo, with a fabulous first movement, with a beautiful breezy open air tune. Da 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 da. Do 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 do. do. Oh, it's a, never mind. I mean, you know, I, I just do it because I can. What can I tell you? You know, I know there just probably aren't that many people around who go around humming Pistons Fourth, but it, it's really a good symphony. I'm telling you, it's a good symphony. Don't let my humming of it put you off. My point is that. Not that I can, but that it will make you want to, because it's memorable. It's really a memorable piece, a beautiful work. There's a lovely performance on Naxos with, with uh, Seattle Symphony, and and Gerard Schwartz, and you really should hear it. It's it's a great work, a wonderful work. Like all of his music, it's concise. It's a little bit emotionally cool, maybe a bit. His slow movements can be deeply moving. They really can be, but the whole piece is it's about. It's about the beauty of form and, 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 you know, an immediate kind of, an expressive immediacy. It's a little bit Sibelian. It's a little bit, little bit on the cool side, emotionally Nordic. He was a New Englander, a sort of a truculent New Englander. And I, I love the personality. I love the personality that that music represents. I think it's fabulous music. After Piston, Franz Schmidt. We have to do Franz Schmidt, don't we? The great Viennese, well, you know, he wrote a few pieces, some of which are marvelous. And his second symphony has already appeared on these lists because this is, you know, the end of the Viennese school. It really is. And the fourth symphony is is a, a desolate, very moving sort of hymn to the civilization that was that was lost. It was lost by World War II. And I, it's, it's a masterpiece. It's an absolute masterpiece. It's a big work, and again, in, in a continuous 45 or so minutes. I mean, the Zubin Mehta recording with the Vienna Philharmonic is absolutely a classic and one of the best things Mehta ever did. It's a stunning piece of music, and, and you owe it to yourself to really hear it. It's, it's uh, powerful, really, really powerful stuff. He, he was a on-again, off-again composer. His most famous work is the Oratorio, the Book of Seven Seals. You know, Das Buch mit sieben Segeln, about the apocalypse and the end of the universe. And it's all nice and very fan. If you like fantasy at the decadence, then Schmidt is a good guy to indulge yourself with. Then after Schmidt, I would say Shostakovich, Symphony Number no. 4, his biggest, craziest, most Shostakovichiest of all of his symphonies, because of course he withdrew it when he got in trouble for Lady Macbeth of Bitsensky. It wasn't performed until 1960 something. It was written in 1930 something, and it, it's it's you know unvarnished Shostakovich before he learned to keep a lid on some of his more um, outrageous inspirations. And oh my, what a 
powerful and extraordinary and mysterious and expressively curious piece it is. But it's also an important one because at the end of the scherzo, you get the tick-tock percussion that appears at the end of the second cello concerto and at the very end of the 15th symphony. It's got some of his most characteristic sounds and ideas that he would use later, but in a very, very different context. So Shostakovich's fourth has to be on the list. However, my, my own personal top fourth and this is a very personal top fourth, I, I concede, is Charles Ives' Fourth Symphony, because it is simply one of the most remarkable pieces of music in existence. It's like nothing else by anybody else. It was so far ahead of its time, so radical in conception, but at the same time so immediately expressive, incredibly expressive. I mean, it begins with the hymn tune, Watchmen Tell Us of the Night, which is another one of those hymns that I sang in my high school glee club when we did our Christmas concerts at Trinity Church in New Haven, which is where I've heard it. So I, I feel very close to this music. It's such a beautiful hymn. Watchmen tell us of the night what the signs of promise are. It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn. And uh, the whole symphony is about that. It's, it's crazy, and it's avant-garde, and it's all over the place, but at the same time, it's transcendental, and it's spiritual, and it's immediately expressive, and the huge climax at the end with the percussion marching independently and softly behind this enormous orchestral buildup with the choir, the wordless choir finally coming in, you know, with, with their wordless hymn, and this it's just transfigured, starry, you know, the heavens open and the cosmos is out there and all of its beauty and mystery. And it's really, it's really an amazing piece. One of the, the great conceptions of the human mind in symphonic terms. And it was Ives' fourth and last symphony. So I feel that I must end this discussion of 16 fabulous fourth symphonies with the Ives' fourth. So keep on listening, friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.